coming to you with words and teaching that will change your life forever. All things that you will ever need in your life, they're wrapped up in the Word. Go for the Word. You need to understand this thing. And when you get a hold of it, keep saying it. Don't stop talking it. Keep saying it. Keep saying it. The Bible says in the city of Ephesus, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Can you shout amen? I said the course that I must follow. In the name of Jesus, prosperity is mine. In the name of Jesus, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Yay! Pastor Chris, word hearing. All right, First Timothy chapter number four. I'm reading to you from verse six. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. That's nice. If you, you want to be a good minister of Jesus Christ, it tells you one of the ways to be a good minister. It says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast also attained. Words of faith and of good doctrine. Some people have good doctrine, but no faith. No words of faith, the message of faith. So you have to have the message of faith and good doctrine. Hallelujah. And then it says, but refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Exercise yourself rather unto godliness. A very important spiritual instruction. He says, exercise yourself rather unto godliness now what does it mean by exercise yourself rather unto godliness he means exercise yourself in the god life are you getting it exercise yourself in the god life in other words practice the god life what do you mean the god life I'm talking about the divine life, the spirit life. You get it? Now, I said the spirit life to be clear enough because if, if you say the spiritual life, you just, you might be thinking about the religious life. But I mean the spirit life, meaning the hidden man of the spirit, the inward man. Your spirit. God wants us to exercise the human spirit. The inner life. The lot of Christians who are not acquainted with the inner life. They do all the nice things. But the spirit is not exercised to God-likeness. And that's what he's saying we should do. Now let's read that verse 7 one more time. But refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather on the godliness for bodily exercise. You see that? The exercise of the outward man, he says, profited little. The exercise of the outward man profited little. But godliness, godlikeness, Acting like him is profitable unto all things. Hallelujah. Having promise of the life that now is 
and of that which is to come. I like this. It tells us how to have a wonderful life on earth and also a great life in the world to come. There are people who have uh, uh, what by human standard may be a great life on earth. But they sure don't have any light in heaven. They're not going to go that way. They're not going to have any part in the world to come. But it tells us here how we can have a great life in the world that now is. And in that which is to come. For bodily exercise profited little. You know, a lot of you give good time to building a V chest. Some of you try your best to be in shape. Your physical body. You want to be okay. And that's nice. The Bible says, yeah, there's little profit in it. But godliness. Godliness. Godlikeness is profitable unto all things. In other words, even what you're trying to get from your physical exercise, he says, if you put your spirit first, you'll be all right physically. Why? Because if you put your spirit first, you would not overeat until you get so fat. Or become indisciplined not to eat and get so thing. See? So, those who want to be, um, you want to be in good shape, still have a great opportunity by putting God's word first. You don't lose anything. You can't read your Bible until you get too fat. Hallelujah. It walks all around. Now, he says, Refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Exercise yourself in the spirit. You know, if a child were left to himself in a room, nobody ever talked to him. Um, he never had to relate with anybody in any way. Never saw anybody walking. They just fed him in a certain way. Made sure he never related with anybody. Never saw anybody walking. Never heard anybody talking. He would grow up lame, deaf, and dumb. And his mind would be blocked. Because you see, we have to exercise our senses. As we grow up, we have to exercise our senses. And the more you exercise your senses, the more intelligent you become. You exercise your mind also. Now you know, when, you, when you're asked a question, and instead of thinking through the question and, and rendering an answer, you say, or I don't know. The moment you say, I don't know, your mind becomes blocked. You send a message down your system. We don't have to think. Your mind becomes blocked. When you say, well, I can't remember, your brain stops functioning in that direction. It refuses to go. You know, it's like when you, when you try to remember something, your mind plays like a film, you know, like the computer. Trying to search for the information, checking all the files. You understand? That's the way your mind works. When you're trying to remember something, when you say, Oh, I don't remember, it stops the program. You see that? And because of that, uh, you know, thank God for technology. But the more we rely on technology, the less thinking we do for ourselves. You know that, don't you? All those folks who have to use their calculators to find out fi five times two. <laughs> five times two. They get a calculator out. 
they got a problem. <laughs> See, 320 times 25, they need a calculator. It's nothing wrong. You're just not exercising your mind. That's all. But that wouldn't have been a, a serious problem if it stopped there. It doesn't stop there. A lot of us just don't like to think. We just don't like to use our minds. Some people say, well, I read the Bible. I never, I, I, I never remember the scriptures. Why? Memorize it. When you were taught to memorize the multiplication table, it wasn't because somebody didn't know about the calculator. They're trying to teach you to use your mind. To exercise your mind. Exercise your intellect. Learning to remember things. See? So all of that time you were in school and somebody was giving you notes and notes and notes and notes and notes to reproduce something. It wasn't because they were so interested in the information. They were only teaching you how to find information. How to use your mind. Tell somebody close to you, exercise your mind. Yeah, see, just like you exercise your body. You exercise your body to get better, to be in good shape, you know. You exercise your mind. Now the apostle tells us something. He says, all of that exercise is wonderful, but exercise yourself spiritually. In other words, get your spirit active. Get your spirit active. Train your spirit. Exercise your spirit. He says, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Exercise yourself rather unto godliness. Exercise your spirit. Exercise your spirit. Exercise your spirit. Hello. As it exercise your spirit. It's great to exercise your body. It's great to exercise your mind. All right? But exercise your spirit. Because it says the exercise of the human spirit is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. You want to be successful? Exercise your spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. See, I like it when the Word of God shows us our responsibilities. What we can do. Because you see, there are a lot of people who, who expect God to do everything. They just want to, all they want to do is say, Oh God, thank you. Go ahead and work. But God wants you to know your role. There are a lot of people who are angry with God. Why don't you go to church? Oh, I told God to do something for me and he didn't. He failed me. You failed God. See, nature never made a mistake. Come on here. Nature never made a mistake. And nature never produced a failure. There are no natural born failures. No natural born failures. Everybody was born with the seed of success in him. And as you were growing up, it was up to you. To cultivate the soil of your heart. Decide to grow that thing or to let it fail. Failure is a man's responsibility. God never made a failure. Never.
No one was born to fail. If you've been failing in life, failing at work, failing in your family, failing in your finances, it's not God's plan. Now, can you remember that? Say, God never made a failure. Think it in your mind and say, God never made a failure. No one was born to fail. So, success is your right as well as your responsibility. You ought to be successful in everything you do. Now, let no man deceive you by telling you that life is full of ups and downs. He's telling you his, his own uh, uh, experience of life. And that's not good enough. Don't believe it. You don't have to fail and win and fail and win. You don't have to have ups and downs. You can choose to have one, one journey only. Upward and forward. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the way I go. Upward and forward. Only. No downs. <laughs> Hallelujah. No downs. He says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. He says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his will. Hallelujah. We were born to be successful, born to be God's glory. Hallelujah. Born to be victorious, to be prosperous, to live a healthy, happy, and fulfilled life. Now, anything short of that is a mistake. Hallelujah. Remember, there are many people who don't believe that. Don't forget it. And because they don't believe that, they can't get it. Now, I've not been sick for many years. And I will never be sick again in my life. But you know what? There was a time that I got sick. And I told you about it. I got sick several times. I got sick, sick, sick. I got sick big. And I won't spend 10 days in the hospital. Many years ago. But you know what? In the midst of the sickness, I said, I believe in divine health. I knew what was better. I knew what the Bible said. I knew I needed to find out something I just didn't know. How to make it work. What was the problem? I wasn't sure what it was. But I knew I, knew I was ignorant of something. One time they were taking me to the doctor. My wife on this side, my younger brother on this side. I still said, I am not sick. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, I'm not sick. I said, yes, you're not sick. Yes, yes. And they dragged me there. Sat in front of the doctor. He said, tell me what the problem is. I said, doctor, I'm not sick. He looked at me and he thought, oh yeah. He now thought I was really sick. You know? 
and they sent me in for some tests, they all came out negative. Everything was negative. But I was, I was in trouble in my body. I said to my wife, I told you I was not sick. She said, yeah, we'll go to another doctor. We went to another doctor. They put me on a stretcher. The man checked me everywhere. My ears, my nostrils, my mouth, my eyes, everything he could check. He checked. Then he was looking. This was 1992. He was looking at me. Then he said to my wife, what work does he do? <laughs> oh, she said, he's a preacher. The doctor said, I see. He said, he needs rest. He doesn't rest. And then he gave me three, three tablets. He said, if you drive, don't take this. He said, you take them one after the other. I took the first one. It knocked me out. I slept for hours. Took the second one. You know, knocked me out. I got better already. Took the third one. Boy, was I good. <laughs> I said, wow. Nice. I don't need to rest. All I have to do is this tablet. So what? A few months later, same thing happened again. I went back to that same doctor. And I said, doctor, I know what the problem is. What about that tablet you gave me that time? Can I? I didn't know the name. I said, can I have it? He was an elderly man. He just looked at me. He said, oh, no. You become dependent on it. He said, just go home and sleep. I said, go home and sleep. I need something to help me sleep. He said, that's what you don't need. Just go and sleep. Go and sleep. I said, all right, I'll go and sleep. And I went and I slept and I was better. But then I learned something. Tell you, brothers and sisters, if you will stay in God's word, you will not be sick. But you know, I learned my lesson and um, I stopped running myself down until the battery was out. Did you get it? You know, some of us will not charge our telephone until it was dead, dead. Glory to God. But the point of all that is this. Did I feel terrible in my body? Yes. But it wasn't going to dictate my confession. It wasn't going to dictate my believing. It wasn't going to affect my faith. And that's the reason they couldn't find nothing wrong with me. And do you know there are a lot of Christians who are dying without anything wrong with them? If you let the devil, he could kill you with a strand of hair on your head. He could kill you just you coughing. If you let the devil. I said, well, we don't know why that fellow died in the accident. Was he supposed to? No. Why did he die in the accident? Well, well he wasn't a Christian. He was very committed. We don't know what happened. What do you mean you don't know what happened? It's our responsibility. It's our responsibility. Oh, my wife was giving birth and then she died in the process. What does the word say? She shall, she shall be saved in childbearing. That's written in the word. Why should a Christian lady die giving birth? It's not acceptable. It shouldn't be. But why does it happen? It happens because we don't believe what we say we believe. The word is there. 
she shall be saved, preserved, delivered, kept in childbearing. In other words, whenever, you see, it is, it is a natural thing for a woman to give birth. It's not a problem. So why do they die then? They heard the other lady died. They knew her. <laughs> Am I going inside? Oh God, I hope I'll come back. <laughs> now to the husband, if anything happens, please tell my father. <laughs> You've been carrying this in nine months now. <laughs> She's crying. She's not even gone in yet. <laughs> That's a labor. It's terrible. <laughs> then she goes in and doesn't come back. And we say, why? What do you mean, why? We make life look here yeah. on prayer. So that's the next thing. I believe I, I, I should um, I should take a step that leads you into prayer so you can understand the type of prayer we're talking about. It's not all kinds of prayer. St. John's Gospel, chapter number 4. Because people pray everywhere. All right? So it's easy, it's easy when you say prayer is important. Everybody knows prayer is important, but we're all praying differently. And we don't know uh, whether or not it's working. All right, St. John's Gospel, chapter number 4. I'm reading to you the words of Jesus from verse 22. Is it getting in? Yes. Is it getting in? Yes. You catching something? Yes. Great. Verse 22. Jesus is talking to the woman. The woman at the well of Samaria. Well, she actually met Jesus at the well. And the well didn't belong to the woman. All right. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. In other words, God's plan was to bring salvation to the world through the Jews. And so Jesus is saying to the woman, now, verse 23, but the hour cometh, and now is, the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers, mm, mm, say that with me, the true worshippers, see, everybody's worshipping, but Jesus says everyone is not a true worshipper. He said to the woman, you worship what you don't know. He said, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. In other words, revelation of God was given to the Jews. And that's a fact. That's a fact. Whew. They are the only original people left in the world the oldest original people in the world the Jews are that's another day's talk but look at this he says the hour cometh and now he is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For, oh, I love this. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. The Father seeketh such to worship him. The true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, you know, some people think that 
um, worship, worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth means? And then, of course, the, master, the, 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 the minister says, now they're praying. May the Lord hear our prayers. They didn't pray. No, they didn't. When Jesus prayed, they heard him. That's why they wrote for us what he prayed about, what he said in his prayer. When Paul prayed, they heard him. And that's why they wrote for us what he said in his prayer. When the prophets prayed, they heard them. When Abraham prayed, they heard him. When they prayed, they wrote down what they said in the prayer because they were not thinking their prayer. They said. All right, let's pray. So go. That's in the spirit because we're not talking. May the Lord hear our prayers and let our what? Christ come up to thee. They didn't go up to him. They sure didn't. Because nothing was said. Yeah, but God sees the man. Yeah. Look. In Romans chapter 10 verse 9, for those of you who are still praying that way, in the morning you get down, kneel beside your bed and keep quiet. I'm like, that, you know. <laughs> After five minutes, relax. After five minutes, you get up off to work you've prayed because you didn't say anything god saw my heart yeah but he was waiting for you to say something in romans chapter 10 verse 9 into verse 10 he gives us the principle of salvation he says that if thou shalt confess thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved for with the heart man believeth with the heart man believeth not with the mind with the heart man believeth with the heart man believeth on the salvation he confesses himself with his tongue so when you believe with your heart your heart is made right with God you believe unto righteousness but that doesn't save you until he says with the mouth proclamation confession declaration announcement is made that catapults you into salvation listen there are many people who are not born again do you know why they're not born again they believe in Jesus they believe God raised him from the dead why are they not experiencing true salvation just because of this error it's a spiritual error they have not with their mouths made the confession. And that's the key. Now, Jesus said, by your words, thou shalt be justified. And by your words, thou shalt be condemned. He didn't say by your thinking. <laughs> by your words. Now, you know, we want God's things, God's ways, without doing God's things, God's ways. It's not going to work. Just think about it. See the mass of people going to hell, not because they didn't believe in Jesus, but because they just didn't say it with their mouths. What a shame. How simple it is to be saved. So simple. Are you a Christian? No. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Yeah. You believe he died for the world? Yeah. You think he died for you? Of course. 
why are you not a Christian? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Then, you know, he, he said, so why? What, what, what are you waiting, what, waiting for? He says, well, um, I, I don't know. Uh, some people say I'm not. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You're going to go to hell. And you think it's a joke. You're actually one step in hell already. He says, he that believeth not is condemned already. Simple principle of salvation. See, we need to show people the Bible way to be saved. See, some of them think that if they, if they went to church, they'll be saved. Some thought if they read the Bible hard enough, they'll be saved. But that's not going to save you. To be saved is so simple. It's the simplest thing in the world. I believe God raised Jesus from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that he's Lord of my life. I am saved. Now, he may not feel saved after saying that, but it will not change the book. It's a spiritual law. Now, you can say, I don't feel gravity. I, I don't feel gravity. Whether you know it or not, gravity is there. You don't have to feel it. Well, I don't feel gravity. I don't feel it. All right, jump off of the balcony. You feel it soon. I don't feel gravity. I just don't feel it. Does it matter that you don't feel it? It's still there. If you work against it, you'll know. Am I right? Yes. Same thing spiritually. You may not feel salvation because the Bible doesn't talk about feeling it. He just tells you what to do. I, I don't feel close to God. I don't understand. I just pray and it doesn't seem to go to heaven. doesn't have to go there because he's here with us. It doesn't have to go there. No need for the prayer to go there. He said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Prayer doesn't need to go to heaven, brother. Just say it here. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's all. Say it here and it'll be all right. The Holy Ghost is with us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Are you still there? He said, the true worshipers, oh glory, the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father's looking for them. He's seeking such. When we start worshiping in church, the Father's not receiving everybody's worship. He's seeking those who would worship in spirit and in truth. He says, that's my boy. That's my God. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Father seeketh such to worship you. He's his God. He's his spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Because God is a spirit. What's he telling you? That your physical body can't worship God because God is a spirit. That if you gave him animal sacrifices, that will not be enough because God is a spirit. That's why he said to the woman, the hour has come that the true worshipers. He said, you've heard about worship all your life. You heard about those sacrifices that brought to the temple. He said, but God is a spirit. He didn't eat no animals. He didn't eat no ox or bulls. No. God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such. Now let's look at the development here. Book of Acts chapter number 27.
You there? From verse 23. For there stood by me this night the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve. Whose I am and whom I serve. I serve God. He says, I serve God. Now, how many of you serve God? You serve God? All right. But the man's going to tell us the way he served God. Because everybody says, ah, I serve God. I serve God. Do you serve God? Yeah, I serve God. We all serve God. Yeah, we serve God. I'm going for service. To do what? To serve God. All right. All right. Who's I am and whom I serve? He can leave us in doubt. Romans chapter 1. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Are you there now? Romans chapter number 1, I'm reading to you from verse 9. Can you see it? For God is my witness. Whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. See that? He says, I serve God with my spirit. Now he's told us the way he served God. He said, God, whose I am and whom I serve. Now he tells us how he served God. I serve God with my spirit in the gospel. In other words, in accordance with the gospel. I serve God with my spirit. In the gospel of his son Jesus. I serve God with my spirit. Do you serve God with your spirit? We're talking exercise yourself. Exercise your spirit. In Godlikeness. Get your spirit alive. See when you read the Bible, don't read it like you're reading the newspaper. Why? The word of God will minister wisdom to your spirit. Has the ability to make you wise. Don't read it like newspapers. Meditate on the word. The entrance of his word gives light. When you hide it in you, it will stop you from sin. Glory to God. It's a light. It's a lamp. God's word is different from everything else you read. So read it with your spirit. Hallelujah. Read it with your spirit. God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit. Whom I serve with my spirit. I serve God with my spirit in the gospel of his son. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. All right, so that can now lead us into prayer. Ready for that? Okay. See, everybody prays, but God wants something higher than just somebody praying, somebody talking. Anybody can talk. Oh God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, because my name is Jimmy. <laughs> First Corinthians. Woo-hoo! I like this. Wow. First Corinthians chapter number 14. Hallelujah. <laughs> From the 14th verse. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. In other words, when I pray in an unknown tongue, I don't know what I'm saying. I don't understand what I'm saying. But my spirit prays. 
<laughs> We're talking exercise your spirit. Hallelujah. He says, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. My mind is unfruitful. Does not understand what's going on. But my spirit prays. My spirit prays. There's a lot of spirits praying, but they don't have no word. And so the spirit is praying without light. The word of God, the entrance of thy word, give it light. Light goes into your spirit. And when you're praying about something, your spirit is crying. But there's no light. You've got to study God's word. See, because it'll give you light in every area. It'll give you light about your work. Give you light about your family. Give you light about any situation you find yourself. Then your spirit can pick up that signal. Otherwise, you're going to be crying in the spirit, praying in tongues, but your spirit is not getting nothing because there's no light. The entrance of thy word giveth light. I, I tell people, I don't have any problem getting answers from God when I pray. You know, a lot of people have this experience of, you know, they pray a long time and fast a long time for God finally showed up well I don't have that problem with God he shows up pretty quick when I talk with him I don't know why but but that's my understanding of God's Word you pray and you hear Jesus prayed to the Father and heard the Father didn't have to wait to hear him when I fast, I don't fast because, oh, God, talk to me. Ooh, talk to me. Ah, talk to me. No, 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 no. I fast to exercise my spirit. Don't have any problem hearing from God. Hear and talk to me. In fact, a lot of times when I fast, it's because he said so. So he already spoke. <laughs> Hallelujah. So look at it here. Very important. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So what is it then? I'll pray with the spirit. Now, a lot of us will pray with our understanding, and we will pray with the spirit also. Look at it. Why don't you do God's word? Look at it. No, our, our, our system is we pray with the understanding, and then we pray with the spirit also. No wonder there's no much success. No wonder the progress is slow for certain people. No wonder there's not much difference between last year and this and the other year and the other. And you, see, you've got to, listen, you can take long strides in the spirit. Just by doing God's word God's way. We start by praying dumb prayers. Oh God, thank you for today. Oh God, thank you for tomorrow. Oh God, thank you. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You, you. you mess up the whole prayer and you have forgotten your praying. Oh God, thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Father, as a matter of fact, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Then you look around. Thank you, Jesus. Then there's a knock at the door. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Father. And guess what? Hold on. Guess what? Your mobile phone is close to you. <laughs> Father, thank you. Hello? Hello, what is it? Hello? Okay, I'm coming. Father, I'm sorry about that. What are you expecting? You are expecting a call. <laughs> From God? <laughs> you know what I mean? Hold on. I said, you're expecting a call. I don't mean a call from God. I mean a call away from him. Are you kidding? If you were with the president and why you were with him on an appointment, Somebody called. You're going to say, 
Excuse me, Mr. President. <laughs> Hello? You do that? No. Uh -uh. You, you go, stop. You'd want to kill the voice. <laughs> Sorry, sir. Did an honor. what you do. But now, you're talking to God. The first time, excuse me, Father. Hello? Okay, okay, I, I, I'll be there soon. Um, Father, in Jesus' name, um, thank you. <laughs> Amen. How? Now, when you act that way, how are you going to develop your spirit? How are you going to develop your spirit? The telephone follows you everywhere. Only available. That's you. You are forever available to everybody. Hello. <laughs> Yes, who is it? Who? Who is it? Yes, I'm the one. Speaking. <laughs> Speaking. <laughs> Hallelujah. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. So I want my spirit to pray. So what do I do? Pray in an unknown tongue. He already told me that when I do, my spirit prays. And I want to exercise my spirit. Now, you haven't exercised your spirit in something as simple as this. But you want to live the life of dominion. It's not going to work because your spirit is not yet domi dominating your body. It's not yet, it's not yet, it hasn't gained the mastery. Until it gains the mastery, you'll function like a slave in the spirit. Whatever happens will happen. Whatever comes, you'll take. Even though you're angry. And unhappy about it. You've got to exercise your spirit. Make up your mind. You're going to exercise. Your spirit. You see, you're going to do it. This is something you have to do. If I pray, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. Didn't say if God prays. Didn't say if I, I'm quiet and I'm just thinking, my spirit prays. He said, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. He said, in an unknown tongue, he didn't say, if I pray quietly in my mind, my spirit prays. No, in an unknown tongue. That means a language you don't understand, which came to you through the spirits when the Holy Ghost came into your life. Look at it, verse 15. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit. And I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. And I will sing with the understanding also. Look at Paul's success. How wonderful. Verse 18. I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than ye all. And in fact, I want to show you something. The reason he said, when I pr if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. He says, what is it then? I'll pray with the spirit and I'll pray with my understanding also. I'll sing with the spirit and I'll sing with the understanding also. It was because of other people. He said, otherwise, if I'm blessed in the spirit, how are you going to know when to say Amen. So he said, I would rather speak five words. Look at, look, look at it. Verse 18. 
I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I rather speak five words with my understanding than by my, that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. He says, in the church. But on my own, I speak so much in tongues. And I'm not under obligation to interpret to anybody. No, just think about your life. You, you, you're praying a whole hour, two hours, three hours. Do you know what will happen to your spirit? Especially when you're studying the word and letting lights come into your spirit. See, I said there are people who are talking in tongues a lot. They pray in tongues a lot, but they don't study the word. So their spirit is still functioning in a, in a dark environment. As far as issues about life are concerned, because there's no light. But when you get a hold of the word and get your spirit functioning like this, speaking in other tongues, you have it made. Hallelujah. All right, look at the next one. You still there? Yeah. Romans chapter number eight. See, I know who I am and I know what I've got. And I can use it. I can use it. I'm a success. <laughs> Say this with me. I know who I am. And I know what I have. And boy, I'm going to use it. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8. <laughs> From verse 26, we're looking at praying with our spirits, exercising our spirits. Verse 26, Romans 8, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself make an intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he make an intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know. You see, that's, that's where you have the success mentality. That's where you have the mentality of a victor. This is likewise. The Spirit also helped our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. We don't know the details as we ought to know. We don't know them. Look at it. We don't know the details as we ought to know. But the Spirit Himself, the Spirit Himself, the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. This is not speaking in tongues. At this time, I can't even speak. Are you hearing me? He's talking about the Holy Ghost. He said, when my spirit doesn't know how to go about this thing, I can't even speak in other tongues. He says, the Holy Ghost himself. Woo, glory to God. Hey. The Holy Ghost himself. You see, he emphasizes it. He didn't say, the spirit make it in the session. He says, the spirit himself. He comes into the matter. Still there. You know, he says, likewise, King James, King James is a little blind to it. He says, likewise, the spirit also help it. Uh-uh. He says, the spirit bears us up in our weakness, in our limitation. The spirit supports us, props us up. Hallelujah. We don't know what 
we ought to be saying. We don't know how to go about this thing, but the Holy Ghost himself makes in a session with groanings that cannot be uttered. Sometimes you, you just fall on your knees before God, you are short of words. Your spirit has no spiritual vocabulary now. He's waiting on the Holy Ghost. He's waiting on the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. So, yeah. Glory to God. And then the Holy Spirit takes over. No one that Jesus said. Comforter, the helper, the standby. He makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knows what is the mind of the spirits because he makes an intercession for the saints. According to the will of God, He's my intercessor. Jesus was my intercessor. And then He went to heaven, but He sent me another one to be with me. The great Holy Spirit of God. He's my intercessor. When Jesus was here, He said, Simon, are you still there? He says, Simon has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not hallelujah but you know what Jesus has gone to heaven now the Holy Ghost has come and he can see the same thing Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat but I have prayed for you that your faith God. Wow. He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know it doesn't matter what you're going through. We know right in my spirit. I know. Oh, glory to God. We know. something it doesn't matter what happens at home it doesn't matter what happened to your job it doesn't matter what happened to your money if you are functioning this way if you are praying this way we know hallelujah we know we know Shut up. 